Can you see me over this podium? <laughs> you know, I, I noticed this has been elevated, and you didn't need to elevate it for, uh, for me. I'm not nearly as tall and good-looking as Bill Lockwood. And, uh, but as long as you can see my head, I guess that's all that, uh, all that is needed. I'm happy to be here this morning. I'm not happy for the reason I'm here this morning in the place of an ailing Bill Lockwood. We all have been praying for Bill and uh, hope that he is back very soon. Uh, very sorry for his absence and know that you are counting the days for Bill to, to be back uh, with his knowledge and eloquence and power in preaching the gospel. But I am honored to be filling his place this morning and hope that uh, what, uh, what I have to say will be of some benefit to you uh, this morning. I have titled my lesson today, Free to Say No, Free to Say No. I was watching a documentary on Netflix some time ago. It was called Murder Mountain, Murder Mountain. It was about Humboldt County in Northern California. Now, when I say Northern California, I'm sure you have an image of a beautiful place. And indeed, it is a beautiful place. A place of redwood forests, mountains. The sea is not too far away, the beautiful Pacific Ocean and beaches. But back in the 60s, the hippies of that generation uh, discovered it to be a great place to go after they got through, I guess, at Woodstock or wherever they had been uh, having their fun. And they went and made it sort of a place of growing marijuana. In fact, even today, after uh, marijuana has been legalized in California, it supplies over 60% of the nation's marijuana. But even before it was legalized, it was a place of uh, growing marijuana. And this group of people made what we would call a Garden of Eden, or could be a beautiful place, a place of trash, old broken down trailer houses, drugs, but the reason it was called Murder Mountain, it was a place that people would go and just disappear. Law enforcement would even rarely go up there. It would just be a place, sort of a no-go zone for law enforcement. Over 250 cases of missing persons. And the documentary featured a woman from Australia who had come trying to find her missing daughter. And the sheriff's department would just sort of say, well, we just don't know. So many people come to Humboldt County and just are never heard from again. Murder Mountain. Well, the reason I bring that up, what could be a Garden of Eden has now become a place of violence and murder. And one of the things it featured was a real-life murder that was pretty well featured in this story. And uh, the murderer just got away with it and eventually moved away to Indiana and just got away with cold-blooded murder. Well, you know, in many ways, it's a little snapshot of Cal. I saw a video the other day about California, a place that back in the 40s, 50s, a place of uh, destination for many Texans and Oklahomans, a place of opportunity, really uh, a place where you could go to the mountains or go to the beach or go skiing or whatever you wanted to do, perfect climate, has now become a place that people are exiting at rapid rates coming back to Texas, Tennessee. The video was called California, a cautionary tale. 
And now we Texans are known to say, well, you can come to Texas, but don't California our Texas. Well, you see, what it tells us, and the cautionary tale is, when you tolerate sin, as they did in Humboldt County, or what we see in California, maybe from our standpoint of letting things go by bad policy and various things, when you do that, it can ruin a Garden of Eden. Now, I'm not talking about politics here. That's not my purpose. Because so many individual lives everywhere, everywhere, Iowa Park, Wichita Falls, everywhere, are lived in chaos, disorder, profanity, drugs, marital unfaithfulness, sins of all kinds, violence. Clint mentioned Uvalde a while ago, and that's very much on our minds. And this kind of life is passed on to generations, multiple generations. And, of course, we think, well, can't we pass another law? Maybe another law will do it. People have turned their Garden of Eden, metaphorically speaking, into a pile of trash, like Humboldt County. Well, that's Genesis 3. That's Genesis 3. The Creator gave human beings... A garden of Eden. It was perfect. Think of the most perfect place you've ever been or you can ever imagine. My wife and I watch Wheel of Fortune after supper every night. And they give these contestants a trip to some resort, Antigua or someplace. And these resorts look fantastic. Worth $7,000, $10,000. Wow, can't even imagine a place like that. But just picture it. Just picture it. It would not equal the Garden of Eden. But you know, even places like that, I read about it in the papers, even places like that, people get sick. Read about that recently. People die. Read about that recently. People get shot. Read about that recently at these perfect places down here. But that wasn't like it was in the Garden of Eden. God, God put in the Garden of Eden just one restriction, and it was for their protection. But a snake... And I guess only a snake could slither in. You know, in the Uvalde, that old boy came in through a back door, unlocked. Unlocked back door. But old Satan took a body form that could slither in. And he slithered in and presented a temptation to Eve and to Adam that they perceived was almost irresistible. Well, I guess it was irresistible to them. And they willingly chose the worst possible alternative. And that would turn the pristine garden into a world of war, disease, Mass shootings, crime, chaos, death. And you know, if those things were the only results of the fall, that would be bad enough. Oh, the heartache. Well, we sat here this morning in our nice, comfortable building. There's heartache going on in Iowa Park. Wichita Falls. There's parents suffering over children who have died 
or been killed in an accident. I think of a case in Wichita Falls where the, their son disappeared years ago. He'd now be in his 40s. He disappeared as, a, I think, a, just graduated from high school. He's still missing. Wouldn't that be terrible? Wonder where your son is. He'd, he'd now be in his 40s. Is he dead? Is he just, did he walk away? Some children are alienated from their parents. Or they're lost on drugs. They're victims of war. We think about Ukraine. I've never seen, never been witness to something like that just before our eyes. And we're doing nothing. You're standing by watching it on television. As this whole country is just being bombarded by Russia and the average Russian citizen's not even behind it bless their hearts by a madman apparently our hospitals are filled with suffering people there are people in hospice loved ones watching them die there are people who are so hopeless they're contemplating suicide it's a dark world. We choose not to see it. We do things to direct our attention elsewhere. That'd be bad enough, the heartache that goes on every day. But there's something worse. Scripture calls it the second death. The second death. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars... They will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Revelation 21, verse 8. And in all of this, God is blasphemed and blamed. Where is God during all of this, they say, in the Uvalde? And any time there's an episode like this, where is God? Why did God allow this? Or how can God send people to hell? But here's my point this morning. The truth is, separation from God is the life human beings willingly chose willingly chose they were given a choice and that's what they chose and God's heart is broken it's broken as he witnesses the choices being made every day by people the same choice that Adam and Eve made in the garden Way back in Genesis 3, those same choices are being made every day. But our wonderful God didn't give up on Adam and Eve, did he? And he doesn't give up on people today. In fact, everything in the Bible is... A demonstration of how God keeps on trying. He keeps on trying to bring people back one episode after another. His attempt to win people back. And that brings us to the most famous verse in the Bible. What is the most famous verse in the Bible? You see it at football games. Holding up a sign. What is that verse? John 3, 16. That's right. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And it's right. It's a good verse. But you know what? People very seldom read what comes after John 3, 16. Take out your Bible and uh, your device. Who would have thought in 2022 I'd be preaching and tell people to take out your telephone and read the Bible passage. I'm old, aren't I? Let's look and see what Jesus had to say 
after John 3, 16. It's vital that we read what comes next. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear their deeds will be exposed. Oh my. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Why don't people come to Jesus? Why don't they come to the light? Because their deeds are evil. They shun the light. Why, why, why are places of sin so dark? Literally dark. Sinners don't want light. On the other hand, just like parents or just like kids who've done something good. You know, they clean the garage without their parents telling them to. Here comes dad. Oh, they're so eager to see him. Dad, I've cleaned the garage. That's the way people are with their heavenly father. Oh, they love to see dad. But if they've disobeyed dad, they don't want to see dad. That's the way we are with God. There's no describing the depth of God's love for human beings. We can't do that. See what great love the Father has lavished on us. Lavished is the word. That we should be called children of God. 1 John 3, verse 1. Grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. We can't begin to comprehend the love God has for us. Ephesians 3, 18 and 19. The psalmist wrote, We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And how true that is. We were so fearfully and wonderfully made physically. I'm just so amazed at the human body. The hands, the eyes, the ears, the feet, every aspect of the human body magnificent. Nothing can duplicate the human hand we take so for granted until it stops working. The brain. We are so fearfully and wonderfully made mentally. We can reason. We can think. The person who says there is no God, and yet he's there reasoning that. Such a contradiction. We're so fearfully and wonderfully made spiritually. Music and the appreciation for music is one of the great testimonies for the existence of God. That alone. Oh, there's so many aspects of our lives that shout for the existence of God. 
We could go on and on. We are made in the very image of God, Genesis 1, 27. But here is this bothersome contradiction. At the same time, we have a nature that bends toward self-destruction. We don't have to inherit Adam's sin, as the Calvinist would say, or the person of Reformed theology would say. We have enough of our own, every one of us. We don't even have to have the devil to cause us to sin. In fact, when the writer James discusses the life cycle of sin in James 1, 13 through 15, he never even mentions Satan. We sometimes like to blame everything on Satan. The devil made me do it. No, you don't need the devil. He may not even know you're around. The devil's very limited. Oh, he's active. And you may create enough ruckus that he'll find you sometime, but I don't know that he will. You don't need him to sin. Here's what James says about your sin. And certainly don't blame God. He says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their, listen, own evil desire. Own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, you see, it's just like the birth process. It gives birth to sin when it is full grown, gives birth to death. That's the life cycle of sin, and Satan's nowhere around. So Paul said, though created with great capacity for living for God and living for good, we also have great capacities for making a garden a trash heap. And you've seen it, haven't you? You've seen it. I've seen it. In Ephesians 2, 3, Paul wrote, All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, or some versions say, Children, by nature, children of wrath. And that nature can take over if we are not endowed with the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit or if we choose to allow it to take over. Every person has a choice. Now, wouldn't it be nice if you could just pass laws to make people do right? Wouldn't that be nice? God couldn't do it. God couldn't do it. Not even God. That's Galatians. Congress can't do it. Legislatures can't do it. But here's things God does do. He posts clearly, easily read signs at crucial junctures to alert danger ahead or great reward ahead. He does that through the scripture. Does it so well. We talked about that in Bible class this morning. In fact, those clearly read signs 
Just like our highway signs sometimes have flashing yellow lights or sometimes red lights. Don't do it. Don't do it. Or go this way. Go this way. And in spite of that, some people say, nah. And sometimes with a raised fist, they say, nah. Leave me alone, old man. Leave me alone. In ways we do not know, also through His Holy Spirit, He coerces and guides people who are His and who do not live by the sinful nature. That Holy Spirit works. I can't tell you how, but I know He does. Romans chapter 8, 9 through 17. If we are listening, He uses history to show what happened to people of the past who chose the wrong road. That's 1 Corinthians 10. Look at them. Look at them. See what they did? He, dispatch, it, he dispatches angels as ministering spirits to aid those who are His in ways we do not know or understand. Hebrews 1, 14. But we know they're there. And He provides those who are baptized into the body of Christ, the church, with good people who can counsel and love and sustain us in good times and bad. That's 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and 14. We often say as we look at others who've made some bad choices in life, I don't know how they make it without God's people. And they don't make it well. But the ultimate demonstration, of course, of His love is the sacrifice of His Son. As we said in John 3, 16, God so loved that He gave. And we can understand that. What parent in Uvalde would not have gone into that school themselves in place of their child? And they wanted to. The police had to hold them back they would have gladly done it. And in a way, that's what God did. He did that. He came Himself to save the children He loved so much. And that's, to think about those parents in New Valley, that's just a taste of God's love. Human love is just a taste of God's love. And yet in spite of all that God has done, many choose to live in total disregard of God now. No thought to God. No obedience. No recognition. In fact, oftentimes there's just outright denial or mockery of God. And they live to see the sad consequences that we see in their lives. And Jesus recognized that as He sent out the, the 70 or the 72 or His disciples on any mission. He told them, now you're going to receive opposition. And if you do, move on. Shake the dust from your feet. Don't worry about it. 
they hated me, they'll hate you. In fact, the Apostle John even added that some are even so go far gone that don't even pray for those people. 1 John 5. I hope you never meet someone who's that far gone. That's a worrisome state that there's no, not, there's no even reason to pray for you. That you've reached that point of no return, even in this life. But it's a possibility. But the saddest thought of all to me is that people will go to eternal hell, but they, in essence, enrolled before they died. You may have an image of them lining up at the judgment seat of Christ and Christ saying, no, you don't make it. And they be totally surprised. Oh, no. They signed up for hell here. God doesn't send people to hell. God loves people too much. Let me ask you this, and I'm going to ask you to use your imagination. Put yourself somehow in the mind of God. Could you send your child to hell forever that you created, that you love more than words can describe? Could you send them to hell forever? No, you couldn't do that to your earthly child. But I tell you what you could do. And you could do it through bitter tears. Bitter tears is give your child freedom. His or her freedom to make their choice. If they looked at you and demanded it, after their denial of you, you would be broken hearted. Words could not describe your broken heart, but you could let them go. It's not a fair description, but I think of David and Absalom. As Absalom rebelled against him, and David cried, Absalom, Absalom, would to God I had died instead of you. That's a father's love. I don't know the exact nature of hell. I do know it's eternal separation from God. 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 9. Shut out from the presence of God. That's what it says. And no one can even comprehend that. Because no one has ever experienced that. In this life, God sends His reign on the just and the unjust, Jesus says. And we see that all the time. Can you imagine living with your mind and your memory and eternal body, whatever that will be like, forever in a place with the devil and his angels and humanity's worst people who have ever lived throughout all time and history forever and ever without ever promise of parole or end. In this life, you may be saying to the God of creation who loves you more than can be put into words, right now, I want to be free. 
I want to be free of your warnings. I want to be free of your blessings. I want to be free of your people. I want to be free of any kind of your responsibilities. I want to be free. And in judgment, God is simply going to say to you, you indeed are free. I release you. Depart from me. I never knew you. And with a broken heart, God will release you to a place prepared not for you, but a place prepared for the devil and his angels. Now right now, once again, you have had many opportunities in your past, and once again, you have another. To choose for the Lord and to live for Him until eternity. And the question is, as we sing the invitation song, what will your choice be? It's your choice. While together we stand and sing the song of invitation.